I'm going to start on some neurovascular anatomy. This is really, uh, I would just sleep through this. <laughs> you know, this was really pretty relevant when we were doing uh, a lot of carotid stents, but now the carotid stents are sort of in the closet. Just, I don't know, kind of know some of this stuff. Most common aortic arch variant, A, B, C, or D? Probably A. Which animal has a bovine arch? All right, seems obvious. Well, men can have them, that's true, good point. A cat has a bovine arch. Doesn't that just doesn't make any sense, does it? So the three branch arch is the most common, so just say three branches, three out of four. Two branches, which is cats and rabbits and dogs, uh, that's what we call a bovine arch, is about 20 or 25 percent. And then the single branch, which is the bovine arch, that's a true bovine arch, is uh, you don't see that in humans. Now, actually, we had a guy the other day that uh, Bessem and I did a, uh, he had a bovine arch and we did a subclavian carotid transposition uh, to move the subclavian artery for a, an endograft. He wound up with a true bovine arch, a single branched arch. But otherwise, uh, you don't see bovine arches really. What, uh, why do we call it a bovine arch? The two branch, why do we call it a bovine arch? What have y'all been told? Somebody has an explanation of what a bovine arch came from. That's what I've heard, that that kind of looks like a longhorn. Uh, but I don't really know what the answer is, but that's what people say. So again, about 75%, three branches. and it, I don't know any good reason why anybody differentiates A and B. I don't, I don't think it makes any difference at all. C is the isolated left vertebral that comes off the arch, and then the aberrant right subclavian is one out of a couple of hundred. You'll see it. Has anybody seen an aberrant right subclavian? Okay, so it's, you know, it's not rare. It's just not very common. Uh, what is the name of the artery indicated by number five? Number five. Okay, so that... What's relevant about that is when you go distally on an ICA, if you're doing an uh, open end arterectomy, is uh, the two branches that you're likely to have to divide as you go up the ICA would be the occipital is the sort of last branch. What's the more common branch you have to divide as you go up an ICA? Somebody said it, I think. Well, it's thyroid lingual facial. You're not going to have to divide those unless you're really screwing up possible. The little branch you sometimes, you almost always, I almost always divide it is the branch to the sternomastoid, the sling that keeps the hypoglossal nerve pulled out. In other words, when you divide the branch to the sternomastoid, then the, the hypoglossal can fall away toward the tongue. Uh, the next artery, if you really have to go distally, the next thing you're going to run into is the occipital. You don't have to take the occipital very often. Uh, what else? What is this big terminal branch of the external carotid artery called? We have a movie theater called, uh, named after it, the IMAX. Okay, so that's internal maxillary. Uh, segments of the carotid artery. You know, probably, you know, they, they, their fancy books have it in seven segments. Vascular surgeons almost always will just call it a cervical segment, meaning up to the base of the skull, a petrosal segment. Uh, through the bone, the cavernous segment is as it kind of goes up behind your nose and then the terminal segment beyond that. That's usually what people will say. But so we'll go through the cervical. Cervical segment is basically below the skull. There shouldn't be any branches. The only real branch that you'll probably ever see would be a hypoglossal artery. We'll show you a picture of that in a little bit. Then you got the petrous portion going through the temporal bone. There's some occasionally this vidian artery and carotid, carotico tympanic, uh, not usually much important branches. Then you got the cavernous portion as you kind of go through the uh, cavernous sinus, and we call it the siphon because it's kind of S-shaped. 
Then you got this uh, segment here again. The artery actually goes through this spongiform area, the ca uh, cavernous sinus. Then you got the ophthalmic brand, uh, section. And again, the ophthalmic, the, the important point here is these dotted lines. Aneurysms below that, so carotid cavernous issues are not going to bleed into the brain. That's where the, the uh, whatever you call it, meningeo, the, the, the meningia are. So you're not going to, if you bleed below that, it's a, it's a bleed, but it's not an intracranial bleed. Uh, what else? Circle of Willis, it's probably worth knowing this. Um, that picture, we'll show you a couple of pictures in a minute relating to uh, knowing the names of these things. I guess everybody's pretty familiar. A1 is the anterior cerebral before the ACOM. A2 is after ACOM. P1, same thing. Posterior cerebral before the PCOM. From here to here. P2 is after PCOM. So if you had a, a notretic P1, a big pecan, that's a fetal, you know, typical fetal circulation. What is uh, the name of this blood vessel? Anybody? Volunteer? I'm not moving until somebody answers. Yeah, try A. Okay, good answer. Anterior cerebral. You know, the one thing to notice on this picture is that there's sort of a, uh, there's not much in this space. There is a little something, but it's basically kind of empty here. So when you inject the anterior circulation, you see the middle of the anterior cerebral. You don't really see the posterior cerebral. If you look from the side view, the same issue, right? This is anterior cerebral here. This is middle cerebral here. There's a gap here. Nothing is showing up there. Why isn't this showing up? because this is normally feeding off the vertebral artery. If you, if you see a lot of, of posterior circulation, then you know you've got some vertebral disease. Ophthalmic, pretty important, anterior cerebral. If you're going to be in neurointervention, you'll learn those names. This is a kind of a thing, if you have tumors in the middle, in the temporal uh, lobe, there's supposed to be a series of little hairpin turns as the middle cerebral kind of folds out through the gyrus. It should look like a straight line. If this is deformed, it would mean you have some kind of space occupying lesion. So those little hairpins along the middle cerebral is an important kind of picture. You know, why do you need to know this stuff? You need to know this. If you're going to do carotid stents, you're going to be taking pictures of the brain. You kind of need to know this anatomy. Otherwise, the neurointerventionalists will pull your, get your, they'll be fighting you for your privileges if you just really don't know what the hell you're doing. Uh, another picture. The only thing to remember here is the middle cerebral, right? Anterior cerebral's here, middle cerebral, kind of divided into this horizontal section M1, vertical section M2, go out through the sulci in number three, and then out on the M4 is kind of out on top of the brain. If you had a carotid stent and you, and, you know, have a distal embolus, and you're beyond M2, probably no neurointervention is going to chase it. But M1 and M2, most guys would chase that with some kind of catheter to try to break down. You start getting out in here, most people leave that alone. Heparinized just say they're going to have to recover. Uh, if the bifurcation of the middle cerebral is less than 10, centimeter, 10 millimeters, you call it an early bifurcation. These arrows are on what's called, again, when we looked at that side view, you had anterior cerebral, middle cerebral. We didn't see this on that other picture. So this is posterior cerebral. Normally, you don't see the posterior cerebral artery from an anterior cerebral injection. This is a big PCOM filling into the posterior cerebral. So this is kind of the fetal circulation with reference to the posterior cerebral. OK, so you got all three vessels showing from an anterior circulation. What's the name of this segment of the ICA? We said it was siphon or cavernous, so that's cavernous sinus. Uh, let you read them on your own. Uh, this, I'm just going to say there are a few weird connections. Instead of a 
uh, it, normally, right, the communication between the anterior circulation and posterior circulation predominantly through the posterior communicator. But an occasional patients have these funny connections that jump off the ICA and communicate to the posterior circulation instead of a PCOM. Uh, you can see the names here. You will see these occasionally in your life. This is the most common. This is the persistent trigeminal, and it's supposed to remind you of Poseidon's trident. And this is, you know, the trident is sort of here, this kind of pitchfork looking shape, so that the, the carotid comes up and fills into the posterior circulation rather than through the PCOM, through this earlier branch of the distal ICA. And you can see it kind of does remind you of a, of a trident. The persistent hypoglossal is where you have what for all the world looks like two carotid bifurcations. And like this, you got a carotid bifurcation, and all of a sudden you got another carotid bifurcation. You know? And you'll see this in your lifetime. It's not that rare, persistent hypoglossal. So this is the internal carotid and the external carotid. This is internal carotid and hypoglossal artery. So you're essentially filling your birth. So these will always have a the hypoplastic vertebral artery origin with them because they you're feeding that posterior circulation from more distally. Here's another good picture of one of these hypoglossal arteries. Uh, so again, this is that persistent fetal circulation. I'm almost done. Uh, again, you can see anterior cerebral, middle cerebral, posterior cerebral. Normally you don't see posterior cerebral. You shoot lateral head film, see posterior circulation, and you know it's a fetal circulation. And, you know, what does it matter? It matters when you're starting to think about how do clots, how, does emboli, how do emboli get to different parts of the brain. And, you know, if you know what the circular willis looks like, you can start making decisions about, well, is it, you know, did this patient have a strain? Instead of calling neurology and ask them what happened and say, should I do a carotid endarterectomy, I think it's much more satisfying to kind of know some of the brain anatomy so you can make some reasonable judgment. You're the one that's going to go in there and actually do the endarterectomy. I don't like relying on some non-surgical specialist to tell me, yeah, it's okay to do an endarterectomy. That's outrageous. I mean, they don't know what you do. You need to, you know, you need to be in charge of, the, of making these decisions. So you've got to know the anatomy. And if you don't know the anatomy, then you can't talk to these guys, the neurointerventionalists and the neurologists, and then they think you're just a surgeon. They think you're orthopedics. We'll call them when we want a bone move. We'll call them when we want our uh, blood vessel move. This is the AP view of the same thing. So you look at AP, here's the basilar artery. You can see the whole posterior circulation on the right side, but you don't see the left PCA. You don't see the left uh, posterior cerebral because it's filling off of the PCOM. Uh, so again, you can sort of see the posterior cerebral through the posterior injection. That side, you don't see it. Any idea what this shows a picture of? What's this? What's the next thing up? Superior cerebellar. What's next? This is P1. PCOM. P2. On this side, what do you got? P1 is a tretic. So big PCOM going into posterior cerebral. So this is that posterior fetal circulation in an anatomic model. This is a picture that you ought to have in your head, you know, basilar artery, superior cerebellar, P1, something you can know, it's not an unknowable. Uh, vertebral arteries, you're going to do two kind of vertebral artery operations in your lifetime. The most common is going to be a transposition uh, where you, uh, I don't want to show you that. Oh yeah, actually that's worth talking about. Uh, vert ends in pica in the posterior inferior cerebral artery in maybe one out of 200, one out of 300 patients. It's, only, it's mainly important because if you go inadvertently sticking a, a, a glide cath, you're trying to catheterize a subclavian, you get up the vert, and you give a 10 for 10 injection up a vert that goes into a pica. Sometimes that can cause a stroke. High injections with contrast into these terminal branches is not a real good thing. So before you really inject a, even a subclavian, it's a good idea to take a handheld syringe and just puff a little contrast and know for sure you're not up a vert, or it's particularly up a vert that's terminating in pica, because they don't tolerate high pressure, big volume injections as well. Uh, basal, you need to be able to at least talk to the neurointerventionalist that says, yeah, there's a basilar tip aneurysm. That's the so-called basilar tip, a little saccular aneurysm that comes off the terminal part of the basilar artery. 
most aneurysms are going to occur around the circle of Willis. So when you, do, you don't have to worry about aneurysms way out in the brain. All the aneurysms basically occur within a branch or so of the circle of Willis. There you can see an aneurysm in the middle cerebral. There's a basilar tip. Uh, this is, they used to have this on, the, on, the, on either CSAP, VSAP, or the written boards, or oral boards. And I don't know if anybody's ever actually seen this. This is the carotid cavernous fistula where you've done, a, uh, done an endarterectomy and uh, you, the thing clots in the recovery room. Go back to the uh, operating room because you've got a thrombosed uh, ICA. You, do, you, try to, you can't get any back bleeding, so you put a Fogarty up and you do a little gentle thrombectomy and you get some back bleeding and you close the artery up and then the recovery room, the guy's got this blown up eye and you're supposed to recognize that the thrombectomy resulted in a, a traumatic injury to the uh, carotid artery and a carotid cavernous fistula. I've never seen it. Okay, that's that. That's right.